so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. The following episode contains discussions of violence, murder, the recounting of traumatic events and sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. It was Saturday morning, October the 1st, 1983, when a routine police patrol drove past a mostly empty car park. Mount Isa, a remote Queensland town, was at the time a region of economic and social instability with relatively high crime. With that said, nothing could have prepared police for what they would find. The Mount Isa Hotel was shut, the lights off and the doors locked. But something lay in the car park behind it. When police edged closer, they saw that it was the body of a young woman, who they'd later discover was named Patricia Carlton. She'd been brutally beaten with a large metal pipe, as well as sexually assaulted. The woman was rushed to hospital, but later that night would die of her injuries. Almost immediately, police made an arrest. But the case would be far more complicated than they'd initially assumed. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with forensic anthropologist, criminologist and author, Dr Xanthi Mallet. In her new book, Reasonable Doubt, Xanthi explores some of Australia's worst wrongful convictions, including that of Indigenous man Kelvin Condren, who was wrongfully convicted of murder in 1984. We all put our faith in the criminal justice system. We trust the professionals, the police, the lawyers, the judges and the expert witnesses. But what happens when the process lets us down and the wrong person ends up in jail? Let's start on Friday the 30th of December 1983, where... Patricia Carlton is having a drink with a man named Kevin Condren. How long have they known each other and what's the nature of their relationship? So Kelvin um, has only been in town for a few weeks, so they've been going out for maybe three weeks. So it's still pretty new days. You know, they're a couple kind of um, seeing each other, I guess. Very casual, but, you know, hanging out. And how old were they? Oh, so um, Kelvin was 22 and Patricia was 24 years old, so still young, early 20s. And they're in a pub in Mount Isa, Mm -hmm. and this is, of course, the late 1980s. What was Mount Isa like at that time? Did it have a high crime rate? What what sort of people were were living there? Yeah, so it's a close-knit community, but I would say it's, you know, it's pretty tough place to live. It's very isolated. There is a high Aboriginal community in the area. Um, So there's, you know, certain social problems. There is a high crime rate. And there's certainly a lot of endemic racism within the police force. And that's something that played out very clearly in this case. At some point that afternoon, uh, Kelvin was arrested. Mm -hmm. What was he arrested for? So Kelvin had actually been drinking with Patricia and another, uh, some other friends in the in the pub, and he'd left at about five forty five in the afternoon, and he'd carried on drinking. He'd then been arrested for basically drunk and disorderly by the local police who'd taken him to the watch house. So around 5.45 in the afternoon, Kelvin was safely tucked away in the police watch house um, and Patricia was still alive at that point and that became very contentious later on. Do we have a sense of what Kelvin's behaviour was like or how drunk he was? (laughs) Because that's sort of critical to the events that come next. Um, Like, do do we know what sort of state he was in when the police came and and arrested him? We do. He was very drunk. He could hardly stand or walk on his own. So later, the police decided that Patricia was actually attacked around 4.15 in the afternoon. There was no actual evidence for that, but it fitted their timeline and their hypothesis because Kelvin was actually arrested for her murder. So she was attacked in the afternoon of the Friday, but not found until the Saturday morning at about 5.40am. But the police needed it to fit with his being arrested and leaving the pub. So he leaves the pub, then he's arrested. 
they said that he'd he'd committed this, you know, very violent, frenzied attack. Then he travelled, you know, a few hundred metres where they found him. He has no blood on him. He can hardly stand on his own. And yet he's managed to travel quite a distance by himself um, before they, they caught up with him. So nothing really fitted, but they kind of, you know, jarred it into position because that was their hypothesis. And he stayed in that cell overnight, didn't yes. he? Yes. He spends that night in prison um, and, as you say, during a police patrol the next morning, uh, they come across a person. Mm -hmm. What sort of state was Patricia in in those early hours? So Patricia was still alive at that point, but she was very, very badly injured and she later died in hospital of her injury. So it was a, a very violent attack, you know, absolutely frenzied. One of the worst descriptions I've seen actually. Um, so although she was alive at the time, she wasn't able to speak. She never regained consciousness. So she was picked up at about 5.40 a.m. and taken straight to hospital, but sadly died within a few hours. How did Kelvin discover that this person that he'd been seeing for uh, three weeks um, had had died? Well, originally he was um, picked up. He was questioned over the attack, but she was still alive at that point. She actually died while he was in police custody. So as they were questioning him, it was only really at that stage that he really understood what had happened and that she died. He he didn't really realise that he was um, a person of interest in the case and, and suddenly it's gone from, you know, an attack to murder. So this is as serious as it gets for Kelvin at this stage. So he is taken into custody by police and questioned. According to police, what happens when they speak to him and they ask him a few questions? What do they say that Kelvin confesses to? Yeah, so they say that Kelvin confesses to the attack. Um, he basically details what happened between leaving the bar and obviously attacking Patricia and when they found him later on. And they say that that was a, a standard confession. It was taken down verbatim, as it were, you know, as he spoke those words and that he then, you know, confirmed that that confession was accurate. And that was written but not filmed, correct? So it, at that time they didn't film confess correct. confessions. Were there any other witnesses or people who had been with them at the pub that day or had spoken to him that the police spoke to? There were a number of other witnesses. So there were the group that were drinking at the pub. They were all interviewed. Um, they seemed to corroborate the the story that he'd attacked Patricia. Some said that he'd made allegations, that he'd harmed her. He'd almost confessed to them about this. Um, so some of them said things that corroborated this statement. However, later they all retracted those. So Kelvin retracted his confession, saying it was coerced through police violence. And they all said the same, something similar. So they all retracted attracted their confessions bar one person. Um, so all of that became unstable at that stage because they had nobody, they had no witnesses, no evidence and no motive, um, yet they still progressed this um, against Kelvin. The question at this stage is why would someone deliver a false confession? Uh, for, for you or I who have never been in a situation like that, we would think that there is nothing that would make us confess to something that we didn't do. And it, I think it's very difficult for the average person to understand why you would agree to something or even be swayed by police. You've done research into false confessions and, and why that's that happens. What What's the sort of psychology behind it? There are a number of reasons people give false confessions and it's not as unusual as you might think. So everyone always asks me that because they're, well, they confessed. So obviously they did it and go, well, nah, let's take a step back. So reasons... Or could be psychological. So somebody could have um, either anxiety issues or a psychiatric issue, which can lead them to making a false confession. It can be a result of stress. So somebody is in a really high intensity environment. They're being questioned quite aggressively sometimes by the police. And they literally just say whatever they they think the police want to hear because that's going to get them out of this more quickly. And we've seen that with vulnerable witnesses quite often. So they'll just say whatever. Um, and it's not even the only instance in the book of a, a coerced confession of a vulnerable individual. There are other examples. Other reasons are, you know, somebody can have a, a psychiatric condition, which can actually lead them to believe that they were in fact involved you know, so they may not be as balanced and reasoned in their thinking as the average person. So that can be very dangerous because they can give quite detailed accounts and actually, you know, nothing to do with them, but they genuinely believe it. 
other people want to kind of inject themselves into, you know, investigation, you know, for a little bit of limelight. And obviously later on it transpires that they know nothing about it and it was just an attention-seeking behaviour. The police are normally pretty good at identifying these different types of confessions. But obviously if they have an agenda and they have a person of interest and they basically coerce this confession from them through, you know, really aggressive questioning or even violence, which has been the allegation in this case, then obviously that's going to suit their need. And they're not going to raise any questions over that because they've got tick, they confessed. So when Kelvin is, um, you know, sits on trial for this murder, do they have any forensic evidence? Do they have, um, as you say, most of the witnesses withdrew their statements what was the basis of of the trial? What kind of evidence did they have that he was guilty of this crime? There were no eyewitnesses to him actually conducting any violence against Patricia. Um, There was no forensic evidence linking him to the scene at all. There was no evidence on him. So none of Patricia's blood, remember this was a very violent attack on him when he was picked up by the police. Um, And when he was collected for drunk and disorderly that night, he should have been covered in blood because of this frenzied attack, but there was nothing. So they have the confession. That's all they're relying on. So even though it's been retracted at this point, that's their their sole source of evidence against him. And what did the court find? Oh, they found him guilty. Yeah, they they believed the confession. They didn't believe the retraction of the confession. They questioned some of the witnesses and why they had retracted their statements. Um, And he was found guilty and he went to prison for murder. What was he sentenced to? He got life. So Kelvin's, uh, he didn't give up at that at that point because um, he, you know, was trying to still convince people that he was innocent. What was the next step in terms of an appeal or, um, you know, being able to present new evidence? Well, it's really difficult for people once they are in prison because, you know, they don't often know what their rights are. They don't have anyone acting for them. They don't have anyone questioning the evidence. So Kelvin was lucky in a sense that a journalist actually became interested in this crime and started to do some digging and basically did the job that the police should have done early on. So they started looking for extra witnesses, which they discovered. Um, There were witnesses in the pub, for example, that had seen Patricia drinking a couple of hours after the alleged time of death, which was given at 4.15 in the afternoon. They'd seen her at like 7 p.m. So clearly, you know, she was still alive at that stage. And you've got to remember, Kelvin is in custody for drunken disorderly by 5.45 in the afternoon, and he's there all night. So Patricia was still alive. They should have found those witnesses. Importantly, there were also witnesses from a local pharmacy who'd walked across the car park where Patricia was found. And they'd walked across after five o'clock in the afternoon and she wasn't there. So they were reliable witnesses. Again, the police hadn't talked to them. And because this didn't really hit the media, nobody had shown any interest. It was just, you know, an Aboriginal guy killing an Aboriginal woman. Nobody really cared. So the press weren't covering it and they didn't even know about it, these two people. When they did hear about it, they spoke to the journalist. And obviously, again, that narrowed the timeline down, but pushed it later again, giving Kelvin his ironclad alibi. So this journalist then started raising some very significant queries over this, which, you know, raised some concerns in the media, got some attention, and that gave Kelvin the opportunity then to present his case. With that first appeal where he presented this new evidence, because he did require new evidence Mm -hmm. in order to to even um, claim that, uh, and it was pretty compelling, what did the court decide? The court rejected the evidence in that case, so that appeal was unsuccessful. And after you've had that unsuccessful Mm -hmm. appeal, it becomes increasingly difficult for you to present any new information. Yes. Uh, What did people start doing? There was obviously the journalist Mm -hmm. who was invested in this case and then there was um, a linguist, I believe, this might have even been part of the appeal, who looked at his statement and the way in which it was written what were the red flags for that linguist okay so to get a to get an appeal you need new and compelling evidence that wasn't available at the time of the original trial so the judge decided that the appeal wasn't going to be granted because those witnesses were available the police just didn't find them so that wasn't considered new evidence now the linguist um 
uh, Dr. Diane E. She looks at voice patterns compared to the written evidence. So remember, we've got a confession from Kelvin and it's written out. It's meant to be in his words. So she spent time talking to Kelvin, looked at the way he spoke, his use of different phrases and terminology, etc., and compared that to the written confession and they didn't match up. You know, his English was was not very good at all, written or spoken, yet his confession is written out in perfect English, in quite advanced English. So obviously this is not reflective of Kelvin's language skills. So that really raised some red flags for her because she's like, whoever, you know, whoever wrote this is not is not Kelvin. There was an interesting point that um when Aboriginal people retell stories, often it's centered on people and places. But this was strangely tied to time. So, like, it said a quarter past four, mm-hmm. which is not something he would necessarily yep. refer to. And what did the court think of that evidence? Was that compelling enough? No, it was classed as not expert testimony. So it wasn't considered um, sound enough, reliable enough. It hadn't demonstrated its, you know, effectiveness in this environment. This is quite early days, though. I think forensic linguistics has come an awfully long way from this, and we certainly understand a lot more about dialect and dialogue across different cultural groups and how they use language, especially time, that being such a core element of that. It's not the same for every cultural group, the way we speak about time. Um, So I think, you know, at the time it was very early in that evolution of forensic linguistics, but her evidence was considered not expert, not outside the realm of uh, what a jury could assess for themselves. It was six years that um, Kelvin spent in prison. Uh, and people were searching for this evidence. And eventually the murder charge was withdrawn. Mm -hmm. Why was that? What evidence became so compelling that they felt comfortable acquitting him? Well, what we haven't mentioned yet is that there is another potential offender in this mix who actually confessed to this crime in 1983. So we have a man who is a really violent predatory offender. He is actually in prison at at this stage for a really serious attack of murder of another young Aboriginal woman. He's confessed to to the attack on Patricia. Um, The police knew about this at the time, but decided not to progress that line of inquiry. So he was actually found guilty of the the murder up in Queensland and police had the opportunity to go to that trial. They didn't. And they basically ignored that line of questioning. So when that came out that we have an offender that's got the same kind of victim type that's confessed to this murder, that became compelling at that point. And his confession included details that Mm -hmm. he, it would seem he could not possibly know unless he was there. Yes. Uh, what do we know about his violent history? Because he's not someone who's who's just in prison for, for one murder. This mm-hmm. seems like a pattern of behaviour. What had his life looked like up until that point? So he had a really extensive violent history. So he was in prison for one murder. The attack was similar in some ways to the attack on Patricia. Um, but he claims to have committed, you know, a lot of other murders, some of which the police do think he is responsible for, others they don't think he's responsible for. But what I would say that he is an incredibly dangerous individual. Um, He will never be released from prison. He could have been, but a special order was put in place to keep him in prison because of the level of threat that he actually, you know, represents to the community. He did know details of Patricia's attack that nobody else would have known outside of the police and, you know, following the investigation. And importantly, he He was in Mount Isa at the time. Again, something the police never bothered to discover. It was the journalist that that really tracked down his movements. They found out he was in town. He claimed to have been involved in the murder. He knew about the murder and then left town and committed other crimes. Was there any indication that his crimes may have been racially motivated? Yes. I mean, he he was very clear about that. He basically said he chose his victims on the on the basis of their aboriginality. So you've got systemic racism all the way through this case from the victim selection to the way Calvin was treated, to the way the victims were treated, to the way the court played out. I mean, if he'd been a young white man, you know, would they have treated him differently in court? Would they have treated the victims, uh, the, the witnesses differently in court? I think they may well have done. So it was literally endemic at every level. When Kelvin was released, he 
pursued the f- the fact that the police had had coerced or you know even assaulted him in order to get this confession. What else was discovered in terms of even the witness statements um, and the way in which the police had influenced what they'd said? Yeah, so the police had been very selective in the witnesses that they'd actually interviewed, the way they treated them. They There were lots of allegations of abuse within there as well. So the confessions were coerced through violence. So I would say there was a pattern here that the police had the person that they thought and they were going to do whatever they needed to do to get the confessions and the corroborative evidence. Because remember, they had no witnesses to the attack itself or forensics, so they needed those witness statements to corroborate it and back up what they were saying. So it was really, you know, those layers of violence and coercion. Were the police ever properly investigated for for their kind of wrongdoings? So there was an inquiry and the police were investigated and it was determined, you know, that they should have gone to the the murder inquiry um, for the alternate person of interest. Um, They should have found those other witnesses that a journalist did, although, you know, the judge said that, you know, maybe they wouldn't have been that easy to find, but the journalist seemed to find these other witnesses without too many problems, so you've got to question that. But they also determined that nobody was at fault, in essence. So nobody was really ever held to account. Um, A young man lost six years of his life, a young woman, you know, lost her life, um, and nobody's ever been prosecuted for that and yet you know apparently nobody in the police did their job properly. Do you think that Mr A will ever be tried for this murder? No I don't think so so the problem in that case is that he's schizophrenic he's been diagnosed Um, he attacked somebody in prison so he still admits to being violent he openly admits to wanting to hurt people he seems to enjoy it so I think he's probably he may well be psychopathic because he gets, you know, he gets a thrill out of causing harm to other people, but he does have psychiatric issues as well on top of that. So uh, by reasons of insanity, he wasn't charged with the attempted murder when he was in prison. He, he attacked somebody. So he won't ever be charged with this because he's basically on the grounds of being insane. Do you think that there have been any lessons learned from either po- the police force or law enforcement in terms of what happened to Kelvin and the systemic racism that it appears to have to have revealed. Do you think that we've learned anything and do you think that that's been put into action? I'd like to think we have. I mean, I, I know a lot of police officers and I like to think that we don't see this kind of real systemic racism now. But I mean, obviously, you know, living the world that we live in now with the Black Lives Matter, it's very topical bringing this up. Um, I think obviously there is still racism and I think, you know, there's pockets of that and people are still vulnerable when there are language barriers and cultural barriers. And we know that there are more Aboriginal people in prison compared to the, you know, the the white population. Proportionally, there are more, you know, they are targeted as young people, you know, who are overrepresented. And so there are still certainly problems that we need to tackle. Um, I like to think the police don't behave like this now. Um, And I like to think that if they did, we'd hear about it because, I mean, before we began recording, you said you'd never heard of this case. If this was a different scenario with a white woman being murdered this brutally by a white man, we'd all know her name. But nobody knows Patricia's name. Nobody knows Kelvin's name. So I think, you know, there are still those layers there. But I really like to think we're breaking those down and hopefully moving things forward for the benefit of everybody. The murder of Patricia is comparable in in violence to Anita Cobby mm-hmm. was what we were discussing before and I'd never heard her name. Do you think that if this happened today then we would hear her name or is there still a sense of white victimhood um, and this isn't to say that, that those crimes aren't still abhorrent and awful and we ought to be talking about them but do you think that there's something we find more comfortable in white victimhood than perhaps you know, a black woman who suffered the same fate? Um, I think we probably would still see elements of that. Um, I still don't think as many people would maybe show an interest. The media may not show an interest. There would be certainly voices fighting for that. But I still think we are kind of, you know, calling for equity in this issue. Um, Yeah, so I do think we've got a long way to go. I mean, look at Barrowville. We've got three kids that were murdered. They'll never see justice, I don't think. And a number of people have really fought for those kids, but most of them people wouldn't have heard of. We've got three kids disappear, you know, all linked, all in the same town. 
Nobody would have known their name if they didn't have a champion. If those had been little white kids, everyone would have known their name. Everyone knows William Tyrrell. Mm. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. You can purchase Xanthi's book, Reasonable Doubt, via the link in the description of this episode. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jesse Stevens. Our producer is Hannah Bowman. If you'd like to find out more about the show, don't forget to join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join. Music